a new baby enters the world. And just like every child before him, he carries the expectation of a long and healthy life. But today, that expectation is higher than ever before. Because this baby enters a new world. Where our greatest dream, to conquer disease and prolong life, may finally come true. Through the power of genetic science and DNA. At the start of the 21st century, we are in the middle of a genetic revolution. Driving it is an incredible discovery that through all of us runs a single code of life called DNA. We now know that DNA guides our existence from the moment of our birth to the instant of our death. That our fate is written in this simple molecule and all its thousands of combinations that are our genes. The promise that we would all live longer, healthier, disease-free lives has come with the breaking of that code, first achieved by Watson and Crick at Cambridge University in 1953. We've been tracking two technology revolutions for the last 40 years, computers and genes. In the last several years, these defining technologies of the 21st century have begun to fuse together to create a powerful moment for a new economic and social paradigm in the 21st century. Genes are the raw resource of the 21st century. The question is whether we're on the verge of conquering most of our medical problems, our major diseases, things that makes us go, makes us go wrong. And uh, the answer is absolutely yes. We're investing heavily in our genetic future. It's estimated that there are more than 1,500 labs working on genetic medicine in the U.S. alone. Our technology is going to have enormous influences on who we are in the future. Essentially, we have slammed evolution into fast forward. But where some are happy to embrace an unknown future, others see too much faith placed in untried technology. I think to believe that the scientific community has the wisdom and the knowledge and the foresight to create a second genesis that can perfect the first genesis, millions of years of evolution, is absolutely, it's pathological thinking. But what do ordinary people think? To find out, Discovery conducted a comprehensive poll to sample public opinion on genetic science in eight countries around the world. First of all, we asked if genetic science would benefit mankind. Two-thirds of Britons believe it will be beneficial, with the Americans feeling more positive at 82 percent. It opens up this whole new sort of realm of possibility, which can be really positive, I think. I'm hopeful for the future with DNA, because it's going to help eradicate disease. Oh, no, I think it's very exciting. I think science has got to move forward. But many people believe that human genetic research is tampering with nature and as such is potentially dangerous. Most concerned are the British and the Poles. Least worried are the Danes. I don't think it's going to help anybody in as much as um, what have they done with it. Uh, it's very frightening overall to me because it's basically humans playing God and creating um, you know, new life form and it's just not, in my opinion, what we're meant to do with nature. It's just not. It's not natural and it's not God's way. On balance, when asked if the benefits from genetic developments will outweigh the risks, just over half agreed, though the British were the least convinced. But whatever people believe the future may hold, the fact is that the humble DNA molecule is affecting real people now. Genetic science is already transforming lives. Disease prevention has long been the dream of medicine, and genetic science could make that dream come true. For every child born at the start of this century, the hope is that by the time he has grown, we will be able to read every part of his genetic makeup and determine his risks from all major diseases. And forewarned is forearmed. 
because it's now realized that the great killers of the Western world, like heart disease, diabetes, and cancer, all have a genetic basis. Together, they account for half of all adult deaths in the UK. One of the biggest killers among women is breast cancer. Every year, 38,000 women find out the hard way that they are at risk. Wendy Watson was one of them. My mother died um, when I was 16. She died from breast cancer. She was uh, 44. Uh, her mother had had breast cancer in both breasts and died um, from ovarian cancer. So I went to the GP after my mother died and said, could it possibly be hereditary? And he said, oh, no, don't be so silly. It's, uh, breast cancer isn't hereditary. But when Wendy researched her family history, she found overwhelming evidence that the cancer was passed from generation to generation. Nine out of ten of her female relatives had developed breast cancer. And I thought, I don't actually want to spend the rest of my life worrying about when I'm going to get it. And I came to the conclusion that the best thing I could do would be to remove the risk as soon as possible, i.e. remove it now, before I've got it. As the cancer starts in the breasts, the only sure way of preventing it from spreading is to have the breast removed. At the age of 35, Wendy Watson underwent a preemptive double mastectomy. What I did isn't right for everybody, but it was absolutely right for me. Absolutely. And I went into this having opened my own eyes and looked into it for myself, and I was very comfortable with what I'd done. I was supposed to go back six months later and have reconstructive surgery. I didn't because I couldn't decide what size to be. And ten years on, I haven't got a clue what size to be now, and I can't be bothered either. <laughs> Wendy had her operation without knowing whether she had actually inherited breast cancer or not. The evidence, though compelling, was only circumstantial. The promise of genetic science is to take the guesswork out of disease prediction. And this is the hope for Wendy's daughter, Becky. But it depends on finding the genetic cause of breast cancer. Our genetic fate is sealed the moment we are conceived. In that fusion of the egg and sperm, the first cell has 46 chromosomes, 23 from the mother and 23 from the father. Making up each chromosome, wrapped in a tightly packed bundle, is our DNA, the code of life. The DNA code is made of two matching strings of chemical bases, joined and twisted into the famous double helix structure. Each of the four bases pairs up with a partner on the other strand, A to T and C to G. These bases then arrange themselves into bunches, tens of thousands at a time. These bunches are our genes. It's the pattern of gene activity which makes all the different cells in our body. But what makes us all different from each other is which genes we inherit from our parents. And that is largely a game of chance. When a couple have a child, half the mother's genes and half those of the father are combined to make the new baby. We all hope our kids will be dealt a good hand and inherit a good combination of genes. Every time we conceive a child, the genes get reshuffled into a new and unique combination. The reason our children are like us is because of where the genetic information comes from. But there's no way of knowing quite how each new generation will turn out. For most, it comes down to things like our height, being short or long-sighted, an aptitude for maths, and so on. But occasionally, nature makes a mistake and a child inherits something from its parents that is altogether more serious. The problem is, with tens of thousands of genes in the human body, how do you find the one that's gone wrong? 